and uh, welcome to the first uh, presentation of the NCCR Automation Seminar Series. Uh, before that, I would like to uh, ask all uh, the uh, audience to keep their microphones muted during the presentation uh, until the end of the presentation. Of course, if you have any question, you can unmute. But during the presentation, please uh, keep it muted. Uh, so our first speaker uh, is Professor Nesmi Ozai. So we're pleasure uh, to uh, have uh, her recording in our, progress. To have her, to have her as her our, our uh, first speaker. Uh, so uh, I would like to give a short uh, introduction about our first speaker, and then I will uh, give the stage to uh, Professor Ozai for the presentation. So. Uh, Professor Nesmi Ozai is currently an Associate Professor of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at the University of Michigan, uh, Ann Arbor. So she received his, uh, her uh, bachelor degree from uh, Bogazici University in Istanbul in 2004, I hope uh, I pronounced it correctly. Uh, and uh, her Master of Science degree from Pennsylvania State University in 2006. She received her PhD uh, from Northeastern University in 2010 and uh, was a postdoctoral scholar at Caltech for three years before joining the uh, University of Michigan in 2013. Uh, her research interests uh, include dynamical systems control, optimization, and formal methods with application in cyber physical systems system identification, verification, uh, validation, and autonomy. Uh, her works actually received uh, many awards, uh, among many more, notably IEEE Control System Society uh, Award, uh, Best Student Paper in 2008, uh, and a Best Paper Award from the Journal of Nonlinear Analysis. Uh, Received a DARPA Young Faculty Award in 2014, uh, an NSF Career Award, and NASA Early Career Faculty Award, and a DARPA Director Fellowship uh, in 2016, uh, ONR Young Investigator Award, and the 1938 Award from the University of Michigan College of Engineering in 2018, and uh, many more that uh, I actually uh, mentioned the most notable ones. So uh, thank you very much, Professor Ozai, uh, for uh, giving us the presentation. Uh, I will uh, give the stage to you for uh, the presentation. And yeah, please go on. Uh, thanks, uh, Wahid, for the nice introduction. And thanks, everyone, for inviting me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be there virtually. Uh, and I hope I can visit at some point in person as well. Uh, today I will talk about learning models and constraints with limited data, uh, and I want to start, so here's a quick outline of the talk. Uh, I want to start with the role of data in control and automation. So we are in an era that we cannot maybe ignore uh, what's going on in data science and machine learning. Uh, Actually, I would argue we are very familiar with working with data in control uh, society as well, uh, but uh, maybe now we can ask a little uh, different, uh, slightly different problems, questions, and answer those questions as well. Uh, and uh, there will be two parts, two technical parts of the talk. In the first part, I will talk about the system identification method. Uh, and uh, talk about how to do sample complexity analysis of that system identification method. And in the second part, I will talk about inverse constraint learning, uh, similar to inverse optimal control. Uh, so in most of control tasks, uh, we have uh, this standard paradigm uh, where we have models and we have a task specification. It could be uh, optimizing an objective function, uh, it could be satisfying certain constraints. Uh, and through the years, we have developed many techniques that takes in these models, mathematical models and mathematical descriptions of tasks uh, and automatically synthesizes uh, controllers uh, or verifies that with this model, with this task, this control problem is not solvable. Uh, 
No, we can also put data into this picture uh, and we can collect some data from the real world. Uh, and from data, we can construct our models if uh, our physical modeling is not in it is inadequate, uh, or uh, we can use data to learn uh, certain types of tasks, uh, and we can still use our old control methods once we have the models and the tasks. We can still design uh, controllers. Uh, and nowadays, this is called model-based uh, control, model-based learning. Uh, uh, and there's also this other paradigm of going from data directly to controllers, which is usually called model-free learning. Uh, I really like model-based approaches, and uh, I like to understand how we can use data to construct models and maybe task specifications uh, so, can, so that we can leverage this rich history of uh, control synthesis techniques that uh, we have developed through the years. Uh, so we can, as I said, we can use data in two different ways. Uh, one for constructing models uh, and models are useful. I like models because they are useful for control design. Uh, they are useful for fast simulations. If we have a model, we can do fast predictions just by simulating that model. Uh, we can use models for system monitoring. So this is like most of the typical students type work is essentially doing uh, system simulations and comparing those simulations at runtime uh, with uh, the system behavior itself and monitoring the system that way. And we can also do anomaly detection type things when we have models. Uh, and th there are sorry. techniques for, uh, sorry, is there a question? And feel free to uh, interrupt me if you have questions. Uh, so uh, going from data to models, it's something we have done in control community for a long time. So this is what is studied in uh, Nejmir, you have muted yourself. OK, can yeah. you hear me now? Yes. OK. Uh, uh, so uh, we have been doing uh, like going from data to models for a long time in system identification. Uh, and this also comes in different flavors. Uh, so there are uh, certain situations where we can collect lots of offline data uh, and we can do system identification with lots of data. Uh, and there are situations where uh, we don't have the ability to collect that much data. Uh, and maybe we need to do identification on the fly. And here are two examples. Maybe if you are sending a rover to Mars or exploring an unknown environment, uh, you don't have too much time uh, to figure out what's going on. You need to like learn on the fly after you deploy the system uh, and probably the amount of data you have is limited. Similarly, if you are handling an unexpected failure of a safety critical system, uh, like your engine blow up uh, in your aircraft, you don't really have too much time to collect data and figure out uh, what's going on. You need to like learn on the fly uh, and react accordingly. So this is the regime where I call we have small amount of data and we need to do online system identification and learn our models at runtime. Uh, and again, once we learn the models, we can use these models for adaptation. Uh, for example, we can change our objectives if we see that with the new model, we are not able to achieve what we thought we would be able to achieve. Uh, on the other hand, we can also go from uh, data to task specifications. Uh, and again, test specifications are useful for control design. They are also useful for system monitoring. So you can get uh, a constraint or uh, you can get a more complicated uh, specification described with so-called temporal logics. And you can use these task specifications or constraints to monitor your system to see if, it run, if, if at runtime there's a violation or not. Uh, and you can also do anomaly detection using these uh, task descriptions. Uh, to see whether your system is satisfying the uh, 
specifications and objectives at runtime. But again, we don't have too much data all the time uh, to learn such tests, test specifications. For example, here I have an example uh, of maybe teaching a robot to do a bartending uh, barista type task. Uh, and you don't want to spend too much time to just repeat this task over and over again for your robot to learn. Ideally, you want to be able to learn uh, from a small amount of data. And uh, you might ask why learning the task is important. If we can learn this task specifications and constraints, this allows us to generalize. So we can go to a new environment or new robot model or system model, uh, and we can just reuse our task specification and we can again apply our uh, classical model plus task, go to the control design synthesis paradigm. Okay, uh, with that motivation, now I will turn into the technical part of the talk. Uh, and I will talk a little bit about how do we learn linear system models uh, with limited amount of data? And what can we say about the accuracy of the learned models? And in particular, how that accuracy uh, evolves with the amount of data that I have. Let me set up the problem uh, technically. So uh, we are given input output data uh, from a linear system of this form where I have A, B, C, D matrices subject to process uh, and measurement noise. Uh, and we want to learn these matrices from this finite amount of data. So this is a well-studied problem in control and there are like two different types of analysis for these type of problems. One is the asymptotic analysis, where we ask questions like, as the data size goes to infinity uh, or the noise levels go to zero, uh, can we learn the system model? Uh, is my algorithm uh, good enough to learn uh, the system model in this asymptotic regime? Uh, there's another type of question you can ask that's uh, on the non-asymptotic side. Uh, given a finite amount of noisy data, and that's what's happened, that's what's gonna happen in real world. How does this identification accuracy depends on the data size and noise levels? Uh, and another question you can ask uh, in the same uh, type of analysis is, uh, what can the best identification algorithm achieve in this case? So you have an algorithm, uh, how does it perform with finite data? And what is the best possible thing you can do uh, to learn for to learn this class of systems uh, with finite data uh, is another question you can ask. And in this talk, I will mainly focus on the first part of this non-asymptotic analysis. Uh, but uh, our algorithm also roughly achieves up to some constants uh, uh, best ident identification performance. Of course, there are many results in uh, both domains. Uh, for asymptotic analysis, uh, it's kind of textbook material. Uh, you can uh, look at many standard techniques. Uh, so Ho Kalman and its extension, that's eigen realization algorithm being uh, one of the standard methods was analyzed uh, extensively. And there are other subspace identification techniques uh, for which we understand the asymptotics pretty well. Uh, on the non-asymptotic side, uh, the, the uh, type of results are uh, a bit more scarce, I will say, uh, but more recently, maybe my uh, references here are not uh, up to date. There had been quite a bit, bit of work in this uh, area in the last two years as well. Uh, so in this uh, non-asymptotic analysis, there are two types of approaches. If I want to classify them very broadly, there are control theoretic methods, uh, again, going uh, back to 90s. Uh, these usually have a different uh, uh, type of assumptions. Some of them do not take into account uh, 
the distributions of noise. So they don't make any assumptions on distribution of noise, but they can give much general results, uh, possibly much more conservative. Uh, and there are more recent results using recent techniques in statistical machine learning. Uh, and before our work, they were mostly considering the simplified setting where uh, your state uh, was observed. Uh, but in reality, uh, you barely have access to state. And if you have access to state, you don't really need to use like an advanced or complicated system identification algorithm. It becomes a regression problem. If you have a linear system, if you are observing the state, you have a linear regression problem. Uh, if you have a nonlinear system, you have a nonlinear regression problem. So the problem becomes a bit more interesting when you are only observing the uh, outputs. And most of the techniques that we study uh, in system identification try to learn system models from input outputs. So that's what uh, we are going to do uh, in this part. Uh, and what we will do is instead of inventing a new uh, system identification algorithm, uh, we will focus on a well-known system identification algorithm due to Ho Kalman uh, or its extension that's called uh, Eigen Realization Algorithm. And we will provide a sample complexity analysis uh, that gives provably gar provable guarantees on the accuracy of the learned model. Uh, in doing so, uh, we will also do some analysis on the sensitivity uh, or robustness of whole Kalman algorithm. Although uh, I will tell you what that algorithm looks like, but the original algorithm developed by Ho Kalman that's developed for uh, the noise-free case, so it's purely algebraic, then people started using it in the noisy settings. But we realized nobody really did any analysis of noise sensitivity of this algorithm. And uh, I will briefly provide uh, that type of analysis. OK, so uh, uh, let me briefly introduce this algorithm. We are given some input output data from our dynamical system. Uh, and we want to find a model of this form. Uh, and even if I don't have uh, noise at all, identification problem is in a sense ill-posed uh, because we don't have a unique A, B, C, D uh, that will satisfy this. So we can only learn up to a similarity transformation or up to a change of basis. So this is standard. If you have taken any linear systems course, you know I can just define a change of basis and uh, I cannot really differentiate this A, B, C, D uh, with this P, A, P inverse, P, B, C, P inverse, D. So uh, this tells us that we should pick our uh, accuracy objective carefully. Uh, we cannot say, uh, I will learn just A, B, C, D. Uh, we should be close to this uh, equivalence class of systems and we should measure closeness to this equivalence class. Uh, so the other thing is that the other reason for ill poseness is that we can only learn the controllable and observable part of any, uh, any linear system. Uh, and what we will do is we will assume the system is controllable or and observable, uh, or we are just learning uh, the controllable and observable part. Uh, so what does Ho Kalman algorithm uh, or its extension uh, uh, to the noisy setting? It's a two-step procedure. Uh, first step is you try to estimate the so-called Markov parameters of your system. Uh, these are uh, these matrices. Uh, and one thing to observe about Markov parameters is they are invariant to the choice of basis. So I can uniquely learn uh, these Markov parameters uh, given uh, my input output data. And once we have these Markov parameters and Markov parameters are also like, if you have a single input, single output uh, system, this is your impulse response essentially. Uh, and once I know those Markov parameters, there is a way to extract 
a realization of your system. There's a way to extract your system matrices uh, from these Markov parameters. So that's going to be the two-step procedure uh, that uh, we will follow. OK, so uh, I will start with the second step. Uh, and this was the original thing that's done uh, by uh, Ho and Kalman, assuming you have uh, the knowledge of the uh, exact Markov parameters. So let's see how we can go from Markov parameters uh, to uh, actual system matrices. So let's assume we know our Markov parameters exactly. What we will do is we will form a uh, block Hankel matrix. So it's a matrix of this form uh, where uh, this anti diagonals are constant. Uh, and one thing we can observe is that this Hankel matrix can be factored into an observability matrix and then a controllability matrix. So this is just multiplication of these two matrices that we are very familiar with uh, in controls. And if my system is controllable and observable, I know both of these matrices are rank n. Uh, and therefore, this Hankel matrix, independent of its size, uh, it's going to be rank n. Now, we will try to do some factorization of this Hankel matrix uh, to obtain a realization. So what I will do is I will take, I will ignore the last column of my Hankel matrix, and I will call this sub Hankel matrix as H plus. And I will shift this and I will ignore now the first column of my Hankel matrix. And I will call uh, this new matrix H minus. And one thing you can quickly observe here is H plus itself is again, an observability and extended observability matrix times a controllability matrix. And H minus is the same thing, uh, multiply with an A in the middle. Once we make this observation, we can uh, go and uh, try to do a factorization. And to do the factorization, what we will do is we will do an SVD to H plus, singular value decomposition. And this is gonna be an exact SVD because we assume our uh, matrices are noiseless. Uh, and we will get uh, this U sigma V transpose. Uh, then from there, uh, we can set our observability matrix to be uh, U sigma over one over two and our controllability matrix to be sigma one over two uh, V transpose. Then, uh, the estimated C would be the first M rows of my observability matrix, because I know the first uh, M rows of the observability matrix by definition is the C matrix. Uh, and similarly, the first P columns of Q will be uh, my D matrix. Uh, and uh, if I just, uh, do a pseudo inverse to H minus with uh, all from left, observability matrix from left and controllability matrix from the right, uh, I can extract my estimate for the A matrix as well. And since I am given the Markov parameters, I already know my D matrix uh, and this gives me uh, a realization. And if my data is noiseless, this realization uh, is uh, a true realization uh, of the system. And this is called a balanced realization. And the uh, singular values that show up here, especially in the case where the matrix is infinite, are called Hankel singular values. So these are uh, very relevant quantities uh, in understanding uh, identifiability of your system. Uh, and essentially, you are putting your system into a, a basis where uh, each state is equally controllable and observable. Uh, so this will be essential in analyzing this uh, performance of this algorithm as well. OK, uh, any questions so far?
Okay, so what happens uh, if I don't have the uh, true Markov parameters, but I only have the estimated ones? Uh, I can still proceed the same way, but in this case, my uh, singular value decomposition won't be exact. And if I know the system order, uh, I can just truncate my uh, singular values at the end singular value, and I can still construct these matrices. And this is what is being done in system identification for a long time. Uh, now the question is, uh, we have been doing this for a long time. We know when the limit this works, uh, as the noise goes to zero, uh, this should give us the right result. But can we say something more precise in terms of the level of noise or level of estimation error and how that level of estimation error is ref reflected on the matrices that I learned? So that's uh, what I will try to present uh, next. Okay, so this is just on the side, uh, our algorithm. And what we want to do is, and I know this algorithm works well if I have exact Markov parameters. What I want to do is I want to give, uh, I want to give you a bound on the uh, estimates given some bound on how much error I have in my Markov matrices. And our first result shows that uh, the error uh, we make in uh, H uh, in the spectral norm of uh, the Hankel matrix itself as a function of the error uh, in uh, the norm of uh, G uh, is just uh, linear, uh, so that the error we make in H is essentially linear in the error we make in G. Uh, similarly, uh, when you do SVD, things won't blow up that much. The error in L, that uh, this is the uh, sort of uh, denoised version of H hat, uh, if you think about SVD as doing a denoising, this low rank estimate of the Hankel matrix that we obtain. Uh, again, the error we make in that low rank estimate of uh, H uh, is, uh, again, the error is bounded uh, by the error that we are making in the Markov matrices uh, times uh, something that depends on the size of the Hankel matrix. Because when you are forming your Hankel matrix, you are uh, free to choose your number of columns and number of rows. And how you choose your number of columns and number of rows will affect uh, the error you are making uh, in your Hankel matrix estimate and in your low rank Hankel matrix estimate. And what this tells you, and this is something people do in practice as well, you better pick more squarish Hankel matrices uh, to uh, not suffer too much from the error uh, that you are making. And given this is how much error you make in L, we can go one step further and we can uh, compute the error uh, that uh, we make uh, in, in terms of our ABC estimates. Uh, and this is what we could show. Uh, if uh, the error uh, that we are making in these low rank estimates is small enough, then uh, there exists some unitary matrices P uh, such that the error that we are making in our estimates uh, is uh, scaling uh, with the square root of the error we are making in the low rank estimate. So essentially, with, in this way, uh, we can bound uh, the error that we are, essentially, this is the error uh, of ABCD matrices that we learn and how close they are to the actual uh, balanced realization of this system. Okay, so now that we have some analysis of how this error propagates through Markov parameters uh, and the uh, whole Kalman process, the next question you can ask is 
given data, I am going to try to learn these Markov parameters. Uh, and given a method for learning these Markov parameters, and we will use a very simple method of least squares, how much error I will make uh, in uh, learning these Markov parameters. OK, so the second part, I will try to talk a little bit about this estimation of the Markov parameters. Again, we have the same setting. Now I am explicitly including uh, the noise terms. Uh, and uh, I will assume that I know the distributions of these noise terms. In particular, my process noise is uh, a Gaussian. Uh, similarly, my uh, measurement noise is a Gaussian. For simplicity, we will assume initial condition is zero. Uh, this is simple to relax. Uh, and we are going to assume we are uh, exciting our system with a Gaussian. Uh, if this is the case, uh, then if I had multiple trajectories of the system, uh, I can look at the cross correlations of inputs and outputs uh, to define my Markov parameters. So another uh, way of defining your Markov parameters is uh, by looking at these expected values of cross cor correlations. Uh, and in general, if you have IID data, uh, you can compute expected values from your data. So this would be a valid way of estimating your par Markov parameters just by doing averaging instead of expected value if you had independent uh, data trajectories. But what we want to do is we want to be able to get this estimates from a single trajectory so we don't have a good way of uh, estimating these expectations because we don't have IID data uh, for uh, our inputs and outputs at uh, given data, uh, given time points. So what we will do instead is we will try to just write down uh, our system's evolution uh, and try to pose uh, a least squares problem. So uh, what I will do is uh, I will take my uh, uh, data trajectory. X is unknown, but I am writing my X here as well. I am not uh, observing the state X. I am observing the inputs and outputs. Uh, and one thing I will observe is that uh, I will try to divide uh, this input-output data into chunks of size T, overlapping chunks of size T. And in this case, I can uh, represent, uh, for example, my y of t as a function of all the inputs uh, from u0 to ut and the state at time uh, x0. Similarly, y t plus 1, I can represent it uh, as a function of all the inputs from u1 to ut plus 1 and uh, x1, uh, which is unknown to us. But I can do this uh, splitting my data into overlapping chunks. Uh, and I can try to represent these y's uh, in terms of known quantities that are used and unknown quantities uh, that's uh, the hidden state x. Uh, again, this is something simple. If you have taken any discrete control uh, class, uh, you can write down what yt is uh, in terms of your xt minus t, uh, the use that uh, you applied for the last T steps, capital T steps, uh, the process noise, and uh, the measurement noise. And I can just like stack everything together and try to like write this in matrix vector form. Uh, and the observation you will uh, need to make here is that if I stack my inputs together, then uh, these parameters that are multiplying my inputs is essentially my Markov parameters. Uh, then uh, we have uh, this process noise, and the parameters that are multiplying the process noise is essentially uh, our uh, observability metrics. And this again makes sense. Uh, this tells us how much that noise is affecting the outputs that we are seeing. We have this uh, measurement noise term, uh, and we have this additional error coming from the unknown uh, initial state. 
So this error term just characterizes uh, the uh, initial condition that we will uh, ignore. Uh, and there are these noise terms as well. And what we will do is we will just treat this as noise as well. Uh, and uh, since I want to learn G, I will do the simplest possible thing. Uh, and I will write down a, a least squares uh, problem. So for each of these chunks that I have uh, from time T to uh, N bar, I want to find uh, X that minimizes the least square error. And that's going to be my estimate for my Marco parameters. And this is something, since this is like standard least squares, uh, we can solve it in closed form. OK, now the question is, I did quite a bit of uh, ignoring of uh, noise terms. Uh, how good is this estimate? Is it any good? Uh, and the next thing I will show you is you can indeed analyze uh, the goodness of this estimate as a function of uh, your uh, samples. Uh, again, I will do some simple manipulation. Uh, I will just concatenate everything. Uh, instead of writing this uh, as a sum, I will vector, I will uh, write it uh, with matrices. So I can write my y. Uh, if I just, uh, th these are like problems of for each chunk of data that I have uh, put next to each other. So I can write everything in matrix form uh, like this. Uh, and uh, my least square solution in this case is just, again, a simple pseudo inverse. This is my G hat. Uh, and in the G hat expression, if I plug in what Y is, I can write G hat as a function of G and my noise terms. And from there, I can write down what G hat minus G is, what my error is. Uh, and once I write my g hat minus g, I can try to uh, look at the uh, error uh, that I induce uh, by going through this process. So there are multiple terms here. Uh, so after I write down the error, I am just writing, applying a few uh, triangular inequalities, uh, metric submultiplicative inequalities, and separating out the effect of different terms. Now I need to understand the effects of these different terms to figure out uh, my data dependence. So there's this term F uh, that's related to uh, observability uh, and observability gramians of your metrics. That's going to be something that plays a role in your uh, estimation. Uh, there is this term that depends on uh, process noise and uh, our inputs. Uh, and we will try to uh, estimate its norm uh, using some concentration inequalities. Uh, there is this other term that depends on uh, measurement noise and uh, the inputs, again, we will use some concentration inequalities for that. Uh, then uh, I have a term that depends on only on inputs and I have another term that has uh, dependence on this effect of the initial condition uh, and the U. And you can use some martingale arguments because this thing has lots of dependencies in it. Uh, uh, and uh, still you can analyze and figure out given a certain amount of data, uh, what would be uh, this norm of the noise over here. You can analyze this. So if you do this analysis, uh, this is uh, what we can come up with. Uh, given uh, input output data of a certain size, uh, and that size will be n plus t in our setting. I will denote it like this. Uh, as long as your uh, number of samples is larger than a given quantity, uh, then with high probability, the error you are making in your Markov parameter estimates looks like this. Uh, and if you look at this, this makes uh, quite a bit of sense. Uh, 
you are suffering uh, due to your uh, error terms. Uh, and if your uh, input, uh, if your input uh, magnitude is large enough, uh, you can reduce your, uh, you can increase your signal to noise ratio uh, and reduce your error. And this depends on your number of samples in, uh, in square root of n. Okay, uh, so we can combine this all and we can uh, come up with uh, results of the following form. Given any delta and epsilon, uh, we can find an n uh, such that if we are given input output of uh, input output data of length n uh, with probability one minus delta, we can estimate system matrices by accuracy at most epsilon. So you give me your uh, probability and tolerance in your accuracy, uh, your probability of success and your tolerance in your accuracy. Uh, and I can tell you how much data you, you need to have. Uh, and similarly, given the data length uh, and any uh, probability of failure, uh, we can give you uh, the accuracy that you will achieve uh, with probability one minus delta. So there are some extensions of this. You can also estimate the H infinity norm of the system since we are using uh, Hankel matrices and balance realizations. Uh, we can also give estimates on H infinity norms. We can give estimates on system order. Uh, uh, and uh, we can also, we have some recent results showing how you can use this uh, for control design as well. So I have some numerical examples. Uh, maybe they are uh, not that interesting, but let me show them anyway. So there were other techniques doing similar analysis, uh, but to achieve statistical independence, what they were doing is that instead of taking all these overlapping chunks of data, meaning using all possible data to do your estimates, uh, they were separating uh, these uh, data windows that you, they use with some number K so that things are more independent. Uh, and we compared a little bit with those type of techniques. Uh, and uh, not surprisingly, if you use uh, all your data, uh, then uh, you get much better error estimates. Uh, and this estimation error evolves uh, as we expected. So essentially we are using practically better use of data and can still give some statistical bounds. So there have been some recent results uh, along these directions. I don't have uh, all of them here. Uh, for example, people analyzed uh, what happens if instead of least squares, you use something like nuclear norm uh, regularization to learn your system. Uh, in that case, what you can do is you can uh, reduce your number of samples to uh, uh, depend on the system order n instead of what we have as dependence, which is the uh, uh, number of Markov parameters that we are trying to estimate. Uh, but that analysis requires multiple independent uh, trajectories as data. Uh, there is some other analysis that extends uh, these type of uh, sample complexity results to unstable systems. Uh, against that requires multiple trajectories. You cannot do a similar analysis with a single trajectory. Uh, and there's also some results uh, that improves the uh, learning rates or error rates, uh, but that require uh, significantly more samples for to achieve uh, these type of uh, error rates. Okay, uh, are there any questions on this part before uh, I switch to the next part, which hopefully take uh, a little less time.
Okay, so next what I want to talk about is inverse constraint learning. Uh, and this is related to learning constraints from demonstrations and ultimately it's related to inverse optimal control and other problems studied by Kalman in 1960s. Uh, but instead of in typical inverse optimal control, you try to learn cost functions, uh, but instead we want to learn constraints. So why do we want to learn constraints? Because I would claim constraints are more modular and explainable. Think about any automation problem that you have. Uh, usually most of the problems that we deal with, they are multi-objective optimization problems. And uh, it's a bit hard to uh, combine all these objectives into a single cost function, weight them appropriately, uh, and write a single cost function that explains everything we want. Uh, but it's very easy to have our constraints uh, listed separately and what type of performance we want to achieve uh, for uh, different considerations that we have about our problem. Uh, there is this quote from a human robot interaction person that I really like. Uh, uh, they said humans don't think in terms of objective functions. Uh, and I agree, actually, I, uh, I don't think about objective functions when doing a task. Uh, and the other thing is that if we have constraints, we know how to do constraint control to some extent, uh, and we can use these constraints to do uh, control and give system level guarantees, both in terms of safety and correctness. But the difficulty of learning constraints from only positive examples is that you can imagine this is kind of a classification problem. There are some constraints in my state space and I want to find the points that satisfy these constraints and points that don't satisfy the constraints. So I want to do a classification in my state space if these are state constraints. But we have to learn only from positive examples. Uh, if you think about dynamical systems, because if you are trying to, for example, teach a robot to do a task and you are trying to teach them the task, you don't want to go and break things uh, to tell the robot, okay, don't do this, uh, but do this. So all the data that we collect in general uh, is just positive example. So this uh, makes it a bit challenging uh, compared to other uh, learning techniques. Again, there's quite a bit of work in this area as well. Uh, so there's work on inverse reinforcement learning, focusing again on uh, learning the objective functions. Uh, there are some works on constraint learning and you will probably see familiar face uh, names in uh, both domains from uh, EPFL and ETH uh, working on these type of problems. Uh, and uh, I will also show an extension of this learning constraints in state space to learning task specifications that are multi-stage described by temporal logics. And there's also some work on uh, learning temporal logic formulas, but these are mostly uh, in the context of you have some signals, you are trying to fit a temporal logic formula. Uh, what we will try to do is we have some control system uh, achieving an optimal control task, and we are trying to learn logic formulas from that. So again, let me switch to the uh, technical part and uh, write down our problem setting. We assume we have a demonstrator solving an optimal control problem. So there's a cost function with some unknown cost parameters. Maybe they are trying to like uh, minimize the time of finishing, uh, minimize the time and minimize the energy. And there are some weights for time and energy and we don't know the weights. Uh, there are some known task specific constraints and you should look at the cartoon that I have here. Maybe the task here is go from point A to B. Uh, and there's some region that's unsafe that uh, we are trying to avoid that's unknown to us. Uh, so this initial and target points are maybe type of constraints that we know for each of these tasks. Uh, there are some known shared constraints. These could be your dynamics or maybe actuator limits. So you might know them uh, as well. Uh, and there are some unknown shared constraints, and this is what we are trying to reveal. This is this ellipse here uh, that's uh, in different 
executions of different tasks, different initial and target points, they are all trying to satisfy the same type of constraints. Um, and our problem is given and locally optimal demonstrations from this demonstrator, uh, we want to figure out uh, what this uh, constraint set looks like. Uh, and to do so, if you go back to this problem, we want to find this alpha, uh, we want to find this gamma and theta, which jointly makes these demonstrations locally optimal. Uh, and given those, we want to be able to uh, plan new guaranteed safe trajectories in new environments uh, that are guaranteed safe. Uh, uh, and we want to determine the type of states that are guaranteed unsafe as well. And our approach is very simple. Uh, so we will just use KKT conditions. Uh, if a constraint is locally optimal, uh, they should satisfy the KKT conditions. So we can just look at the demonstrator problem. We can rewrite it in our standard optimization form with inequality and equality constraints. Uh, and we can write down the KKT conditions for this. So there will be primal feasibility, uh, Lagrange multipliers, complementary state slackness, uh, and stationary constraints. Uh, and in this problem, we will try to extract uh, gamma and theta uh, that satisfies these constraints. So given my KKT conditions, uh, if I can find some alpha, gamma, and a set of uh, Lagrange multipliers, this alpha and gamma describes uh, a feasible uh, constraint and cost parameterization uh, that I have. Uh, this doesn't mean that that constraint is guaranteed uh, safe or unsafe in the sense that there could be uh, multiple alphas and gammas that are feasible for this problem. If you want to extract safe or unsafe regions, you need to do a quantifier elimination uh, to the uh, feasible set that appears here. And we have techniques for doing that as well. Uh, and we also have some geometric analysis uh, as to what can be learned uh, using KKT uh, and what cannot be learned. And one thing is that for constraints, we are using parameterizations of constraints, maybe things like or oh, my constraint is a union of ellipses, or my constraint is a union of boxes, uh, and good parameterizations help uh, in learning. Uh, and it turns out that uh, these problems uh, for many constraint, real, uh, uh, constraint uh, parameterizations that are just mixed integer linear programming representable or mixed integer convex programming representable, depending on your constraint parameterization. So we have applied this to uh, many interesting tasks in manipulation. For example, here you are uh, trying to go uh, and serve maybe a cup of coffee to a person. Uh, and there are some uh, glasses over here. You don't want to hover over them because it's dangerous. If, you, if your cup slips, uh, you can just break a bunch of things. And there's this ellipsoidal uh, constraint in the constraint space that uh, the demonstrator is avoiding. And we can learn that with a very few number of demonstrations indeed. Again, a similar task where now you also have, maybe you are carrying a coffee cup and you don't want to uh, turn it too much because you can now uh, spill the liquid in it. Uh, so it poses some additional constraints on your uh, actuator. Uh, and in this case, uh, we have both workspace constraints and uh, pause constraints on the actuator. Uh, and uh, again, with a few uh, examples and demonstrations, we can learn these constraints. And the other nice thing we can do is uh, we can give these demonstrations in VR environments uh, and uh, we can learn and plan with the learn constraints. Uh, here's another example uh, with quadrotor navigation. Uh, this example, the dynamics is uh, higher dimensional, constraints are higher dimensional. 
uh, and uh, we can still learn uh, where these obstacles are, what are the uh, constraints on the pose of the quadrotor, uh, and we can go and plan uh, with uh, those constraints. So this is learn this was learning constraints at the uh, state space, but in general, if you are thinking about an advanced automation task, uh, there are multiple stages of things. It's hard to like have a constant constraint on your state space to explain a complex task. Uh, and uh, we have an extension to, to this uh, setup uh, using uh, temporal logics and combining our constraint learning framework with uh, temporal logic learning. And the challenge here, uh, again, uh, is uh, there are hard constraints that are time varying that needs to be satisfied, and we only have a small number of positive demonstrations. Uh, and again, we want to learn these test constraints uh, from safe and locally optimal demonstrations and plan with those in new environments. Uh, and uh, the key observation here is that, again, similar, any trajectory that satisfies the known constraints and leads to a lower uh, cost function must violate the unknown constraints. So that's our key observation. Uh, and we use this to eliminate uh, possible uh, constraint realizations uh, in a iterative loop. The other observation is that uh, continuous trajectories should satisfy KKT conditions. It's similar to what we have earlier. Uh, and uh, we have a more general constraint parametrization that has two parts, where, where one of the parts uh, describe this low level constraints uh, regarding uh, are state space regions, and there are like high level parametrization on what your structure of the temporal logic formula looks like. Uh, and uh, using these, again, we can uh, come up with a mixed integer convex program to learn uh, with, uh, uh, with a few uh, demonstrations. Okay, so there are again two levels. At the high level, we use KKT. At the low level, we use this fact that uh, if you are not doing something, uh, there, if you are not visiting certain subspace, uh, certain uh, state space regions, uh, that's because that should be violating your constraints, and we are extracting those. Uh, state space regions with a new notion of uh, discrete optimality at the task level. So let me show you a, a simple demonstration of this. Uh, we learned this multi-state task in a VR environment with uh, one or two demonstrations. And the task is go grab uh, a cup of soup, place it into a small box. It will go and place it into a small box. So this is... Uh, Glenn Chow, who, was the, who is the PhD student leading this project, demonstrating the task on the VR environment. Then you place this into the blue region. Then you take the cheese it box uh, and you deliver it to the green region. And while doing both of these things, your end effector should not rotate too much uh, to avoid spills. Uh, and this is the VR demonstration that we have. Uh, and we learn the constraints and we have a mechanism to just put it onto a real robot in a totally different environment. But the task is the same, the objects are the same. And the robot with the learn constraints goes, goes and grabs the soup, puts it into the small box. Uh, it's a little slow, but it will deliver it to the uh, blue region. It's going a bit slow, uh, but this is my la last slide, I promise. Uh, then it will take the cheese it. I can maybe speed it up a little bit. It takes the cheese it and puts it into small bags. 
Okay, uh, so here are maybe some quick conclusions. Uh, we have some results on both learning models and tasks with limited amount of data. Uh, and there are some exciting uh, directions that we are working on, but I will stop here uh, in the interest of time. Uh, okay, thank you very much, Professor Azai, for uh, a great and very interesting presentation.